AI and Bitcoin merging here in this next potential bull run. Exponential growth, it seems, in both. So I think it's entirely logical for you to imagine this network of AI agents transacting in, what are they gonna transact with? Are they gonna be opening bank accounts? Are you gonna give them access to your bank account? No. Are they gonna be navigating thousands of different, um, forgive my French coins? Uh, no, they're gonna be very clearly transacting in the native currency of the internet, which is Bitcoin. You know, the city of Austin raided my office five years ago looking for me to because I was operating in a TNC illegally. We obviously saw that Elon purchase X with the whole release of the Twitter files and everything like that. So I don't know if we're going to go tinfoil hat here and uh, kind of, uh, you know, maybe see Bing bong. I am live with another edition of the State of Bitcoin podcast where I've got the man, the myth, the legend, Chris David of Open Agents, who is revolutionizing the AI game. And I want to I want to start right off the bat here, Chris. Like, how do you see AI and Bitcoin merging here in this next potential bull run? There's a lot of uh, varying factors, exponential growth it seems in both. So, how you doing? And uh, where do you see all this going? Hey, Ben. Uh, exciting times, yeah. Both for this sort of platform shift underway to AI and this sort of monetary shift underway to Bitcoin. Uh, and I am fascinated at the intersection of these two things. And I think they naturally go together. I mean, I'd say that the, the short answer is we see AI and particularly kind of the, the new generation of AI being not just the language models that everyone's been excited about, uh, the LLMs and ChatGPT. It's like, okay, that's unlocked some amount of productivity gain. But really, we see the future. And apparently, a lot of the other players like OpenAI see the future as belonging to AI agents which are basically like AI that works for you. It's the LLM powered innovation paired with other kinds of software and business automation. And we're, we're not alone in thinking that in the near future, every company, every person, every family, every household, every corporation is going to have one or more agents working on their behalf, um, involved in their business processes, making transactions on their behalf. And the question that we ask is, where do you want to get those agents from? Do you want to get them from the big corporations like Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, who are doing who knows what with your data, selling it in who knows how many ways? Uh, the code is not open. They've got their sort of, uh, you know, particularly whether they're woke or, you know, data abuse practices. Uh, or should we get this from an open network built on open protocols using open money? So I think it's entirely logical for you to imagine this network of AI agents transacting in, what are they going to transact with? Are they going to be opening bank accounts? Are you going to give them access to your bank account? No. Are they going to be navigating thousands of different, um, forgive my French, shit coins? Uh, no. They're going to be very clearly transacting in the native currency of the internet, which is Bitcoin. And then just the question is, what is the infrastructure that we need to build to make that a reality and sooner than later? Yeah, hundred percent. So, I mean, there's a lot, a lot to unpack there. The first thing that I want to go into is like, you know, we obviously saw that Elon purchase X with the whole release of the Twitter files and everything like that. So I don't know if we're going to go tinfoil hat here and uh, kind of, uh, you know, maybe see what the other like big corporations that you named, like with chat GBT, like Microsoft, all these big players, like, how do you think that they, they, they could potentially utilize that now to or essentially like weaponize AI, right? I mean, I mean, we're giving a lot of power to these social media companies, a lot of the big companies, as opposed to, you know, giving more power to the people. So uh, I guess in short, like, why wouldn't they open their protocol and kind of move that way? Like, what advantages do you see that they could have from, I guess, keeping that closed network and I guess in a sense, kind of trying to manipulate people utilizing AI? The big corporations would love to be between you and your relationship with AI. Um, it's a fundamentally empowering technology. It like improves or increases your agency. And the large corporations and governments are, I think, increasingly going to see AI and AI-enabled businesses or people as a threat. It's something that they want to control. You're already seeing a bunch of people trying to uh, clamp down on open source AI for some, you know, somewhat legitimate but largely bogus concerns that, oh, if you're opening up things, then maybe China will use this against you. Now, there's always legitimate concerns 
about like what's going on. But I think the the larger concern there is to make sure that the sort of closed kind of communist approach of trusting the government does not make its way to the United States. Uh, we need to be the beacon of freedom. Um, the openness is just absolutely a necessity. And, and to that specific point, people talking recently about whether or not open models should be restricted because it benefits China. Well, you know, Linux, for example, um, uh, is available in China. But can you imagine in the early days of computing saying, no, we shouldn't have a Linux. We should have, you know, the governments and and who knows what, you know, government spyware they're enabling. That should be the only way of doing things. So the, the concern is that these large corporations are going to implement some soft version of what China is already doing. Where China is right now, the Chinese Communist Party is on the leading edge of applying AI to censor and subjugate their population. The social credit scores are nightmarish. And we see already this sort of intersection between AI and new technology and money happening here with people trying to push CBDCs in the US. Um, Bitcoin really is the only countervailing force. And so we really hope to have Bitcoin sort of pair with AI as a liberating technology. Uh, those two things have to go together, pushing back against the sort of fiat plus shitcoin slash crypto enabled CBDC. Like that is the battle for the future as we see it. Yeah. And then you you brought up agents. So I kind of want to dive into that because it almost like I, I see like the movie with I wrote or the world with like I robot, right? That Will Smith movie like back in the day where essentially like everything's being helped out by a robot. But how do you see like AI revolutioning it, everything from like business to the household? Because obviously we've seen seen it with business, some some sort of reporting, um, writing out some things. I know a lot of college students use it to help write essays and things like that. But how do you see, I guess, maybe like AI revolutionizing everybody's day to day, um, whether it's like, you know, household and that that kind of thing, where you think like, you know, agents are going to be, I, I guess, more so in, in the homes opposed to just like the business use cases? Well, I have to start with what's top of mind for me. I'm a developer. So the majority of my time day to day, aside from, you know, managing on my developers is developing and coding. And I am excited and it particularly to help bring about the future where instead of working with, you know, six people who may be able to do a collective, you know, 200 hours a week, if we're able to make use of the sort of equivalent of an AI engineer who we're able to spin up 10 different copies of and have those working, not necessarily replacing all of our people, but at least, you know, multiplying the productivity times 10 or 100x, um, that's absolutely huge. I think you'll, you'll increasingly see, um, you know, anything relating to financial or data hygiene, I could see in, in the household people, you know, having agents do more and more for them, particularly as you just to give one example, you've got an absolute, um, you know, onslaught of spam calls and, and AI is only making that worse. And, and, and like my phone is unusable. I can't, I can't receive phone calls because who knows what list my number number is on, or there's people just like, you know, war dialing a whole bunch of BS and scams all over the place. Um, for certain things like that, where you're going to want clean communication channels open for like, if you get a text from your family or whatever, you're going to need to have your own sort of defensive AIs defending against all of the stuff that people are offensively doing against you. Um, so there, there's there's going to be all sorts of um, you know services that offer that. But part of the problem right now, you have this sort of fragmented landscape of you know there's probably a bunch of a whole bunch of different companies trying little things here and there. But it's really difficult to evaluate the quality of any of the agents. We hear all sorts of complaints of, for example, companies in the enterprise where they're just kind of tired or burned out of all of the big flashy demos that people are trying to sell them on. And their experience using the actual technology is like it, the, the technology is just not good enough yet. So you have a lot of hype, you have a lot of BS, you have a lot of flashy demos. There's very clearly in the future going to be AI and like AI enabled workflows dramatically more prevalent than they are now. But the question is, how do we get from here to there? And part of how we think that like actual value will emerge is by being more transparent and having these things occur 
in a marketplace or an open marketplace. So imagine if instead of me, need to, me needing to take the word of some company who says, oh yeah, our AI employee can do X, Y, and Z, and they want me to pay 10 grand up front or do a bunch of integrations into theirs, but it turns out that it wasn't what we needed. There needs to be some some equivalent of like a job hiring process where where instead of you you know, vetting the um, employee who joins your company. It's like, how do you vet the agent? You're not going to be able to vet an AI unless you can see its code, you can see its weights, you can see the process that it, that, that it, uh, you know, uses. And ideally, you've also got some sort of like reputation system, some reviews about it. It's like, you know, you want to hear what other people are using that productively for. Um, and so there, there's this whole level of like, you know, community kind of crowdsourced checking and verification that just has not existed at all. That's partly why we're calling our company open agents is because we think the agent economy needs a level of transparency and openness, inspectability and accountability in it that is just not there at all in the current sort of agent economy where everyone's trying to build in these closed source ways. And just how you do that is the standard. It's the same reason that companies feel way more comfortable building on Linux, or a lot of them feel more comfortable building on Linux because it's inspectable. You can, you know, it's, it's been battle tested by thousands of different engineers over time. And we just need to see that same equivalent happen for agents. Now, I, I have a question on, on like more of the governance side of things, because you brought up like people, I guess, use, utilizing the argument that the openness of like open AI, like open agents, like what you guys are doing, like more open source code, code essentially fuels China. Whereas like, you know, if you if you see some of the AI stuff, I mean, like there's some commercials that are being thrown on like the, the YouTube channel that I have of like Michael Saylor looking for an airdrop of ETH and Bitcoin. You just got to scan this QR code, which obviously is a scam utilizing AI that he hasn't hasn't done. So I guess I, on the flip side of things, do you think that there's going to be any like heavy governance coming down? Like, is it going to be, I guess, almost like similar FUD that we've seen in Bitcoin throughout Bitcoin's history, where it's like, oh, government's going to stop AI or that kind of thing. Like, is, is there anything along those lines that really worries you going forward? Are you looking for the best way to store your seed phrase? Well, I've got it for you. It's Stamp Seed. They've got the number one punch place where you can order a full on package where they've got every single thing. They've got all the letters. You could just get it in there. And they've got this sick, sick hammer, which they've engineered to make it so easy for you to punch in that titanium steel plate and store your seed phrase in the most secure way possible. So go ahead and get your Bitcoin off of these exchanges and use promo code green candle for 15% off. They're helping power the show. They've got the uh, Bitcoin logo. You can punch it into your seed phrase as well. If you could see it here, they've got a lot of cool stuff. And now I'm helping empower you to get your Bitcoin off an exchange utilizing stamp seed and storing your seed phrase in the most secure way possible. Now get to it. All right, back to the show. Well, there are certainly people trying to regulate the new technology. There's certainly people scaremongering and using occasions like the the sort of, you know, the kind of obvious things where you've got deep fakes and, and um, people's art being used without their consent to kind of scaremonger and make the argument that we need all sorts of like large regulatory agencies that there's just always that whenever you have like massive government and and business interests that have an incentive to you know use that um you know force of government to to create barriers for the competitors um that's absolutely happening and going to happen um the 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 beautiful part about building on open protocols is that we just don't need to ask people for permission. Um, and, you know, we're, we are able to build, particularly if, you know, people building on open protocols can also start harnessing the productivity advances of the newer technologies and kind of like also lead on that. We're going to be able to evolve at a level that just cannot be, um, you know, regulated or we'll be able to outmaneuver them. One, one example that's coming to mind is, you know, you've got some of these companies like, Tornado Cash and some of these, um, you know, companies that have been working for years to do certain financial activities that central regulatory agencies have been frowning on. They've started taking legal and regulatory action. But like, what if that exact 
type of technology becomes decentralized using open protocols to the point where there's like not, not even anyone really to go after. Like it just it just becomes kind of a fact. And so there are people who have been, you know, one of the like innovations I saw in the last few weeks was like taking the the type of mixing that uh, Tornado was doing and just like having it run on the open protocol called Noster. And like now anybody around the world can just like click to spin up that service and now they can provide that service if they want to. I think you'll start to see the same thing with eCash. Like what if you get a whole bunch of people all around the world creating these little mints? Like it, th there will be some trade-off between, you know, having services that are large enough to, you know, attract customers like a, like a tornado cash, which may have money for marketing that an open network maybe, maybe doesn't versus, but, but, but I do think that once, enough infrastructure gets built such that services can be provided in aggregate. I think it's going to end up being way more um, kind of reputable than the like centralized people. So for example, Tornado, part of why they got in trouble is they were marketing specifically to like criminals, like saying, Hey guys, like, you, you know, they were like aggressively courting like criminals. And um, I, I, I think that, as things get built increasingly on open networks, which also have built-in reputation. For example, I wrote the initial draft of NIP32 um, for Noster, uh, which began as sort of like key-based reputation and it evolved that like the final version of it was kind of like labeling where reputation is one version. Of it. But basically we have this mechanism now that a bunch of different parties within that are like building on Noster agree on for how key-based reputation should work. And so, if people are creating, whether they're eCash mix, uh, you know, eCash mints or various services, all of those services can provide reputation. And if I choose as a US based company, like I only want to work with people that are meet this criteria of, you know, doing stuff that fits the US regulations, that's, that's up to me to do. But a company who's in El Salvador can make different trade offs, and a company that's in Russia or Iran can make different trade offs based on their customers. And we don't all need to have these kind of like siloed infrastructures that are vulnerable to attack. Um, it's, it's going to be dramatically more distributed. Now with that, right? I mean, you know, it is kind of seeming like it, it's almost an attack on, on code, right? Um, so like, I guess let's just jump, jump right in. Like, do you view code as essentially like, a, I guess, a, an extension of speech, so to speak? So it's like almost like, you know, code should be, fr freedom to code should be freedom of speech. Well, I do think at least in America where I, I'm an American, you know, we have freedom of speech and if code, which I think falls under F First Amendment, now I'm not a lawyer, disclaimer, uh, but if, if, if I can code freely and, you know, it's, 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 it's really interesting because if I create an app where I'm able to speak freely, but part of what I'm speaking freely are numbers that someone else values as money, <laughs> like, like the United States is going to have to either um, adopt the the thinking that money is speech and like I have freedom of transacting, or they're going to have to clamp down on it. Because if it runs over the same rails, if you've got open protocols, call it, let's just say the stack is Bitcoin Lightning Noster. Um, and if I can send a message, can I send a message? Yes, I have freedom of speech. If my message contains payment information, can I still do that? Um, now, the government may not see it that way. They may say, well, you know, speech is one thing, but money is another. But if these things are running over the same kind of distributed protocols that are not just like resistant to attack, but are actually anti-fragile, such that when you attack it, when you attack a tornado, you make a thousand mini tornadoes. That's kind of the future that we're moving toward. It, it It's going to, I think, increasingly shift the balance of power away from the, call it, dying fiat legacy institutions towards these open networks. And I think we are, you know, we on the open side are increasingly going to be able to force the legacy providers to some sort of negotiating table. You're starting to see some of that happen now with ETFs. I mean, can you imagine back when uh, Bitcoin was was issued that, that 15 years later, like we'd have the largest financiers in the world, like holding Bitcoin and shilling Bitcoin on television. Like, that's hilarious. Um, uh, <laughs> so I think, yeah, I, th I think you'll see, I, I think you'll see that kind of having the old powers, at least some of them want to participate in the new system because you're just going to have 
I think an increasing amount of economic and monetary value flowing to the new system. Um, I don't know what your question was, but I'm really excited about all this. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I honestly, I, I really like that answer because I do think it's it's very interesting topic where it's like, all right, well, is code freedom of it's code like grouped in with speech or is it almost like, you know, well, now we're mixing in money and like transaction of that. And as we know, as Bitcoiners, right, a government's always going to want to try to control that money system. And so it seems like there's going to be an increased, uh, I guess, resistance to the code, which I think obviously highlights the necessity for more open protocols. But, you know, I, I, I it, on the flip side of things, too, it's like, I don't know if we have like, I don't know, thousands of Satoshis out there that are going to be willing to create something that could revolutionize whatever industry it is, whether it's AI or whatever. And then all of a sudden go from like, uh, I don't know, like the deep message boards and then all of a sudden disappear. And so because of that, then it would be then I where I see this going is like maybe the government is trying to attack people who are doing more of these open source coding projects um if they put their name behind it and then basically people are just gonna have to try to go uh almost like full nim there to to try to like open and create um some of these open source projects and yeah i mean that's one thing that like really worries me going forward is like just essentially like it's an attack on on bitcoin and an attack on like the open source network of things because of of the control factor right maybe that's really orwellian or whatever like the 1984 or 5 or whatever it is like kind of viewpoint but i i definitely see like that going somewhere but i do agree with you on the point that you know tornado cash was essentially marketing saying like hey if you want to do whatever you want like criminals here come 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 to papa basically and uh and work with us um so i think that's part of the reason why they went after them but you know, I see it as kind of like a growing rev revolution globally. Obviously, you and I are both in the U.S. We have freedom of speech or whatever. So land of the free in quotes um, there. But um, so, yeah, I don't know where I'm, where I'm really going with this. But uh, do you kind of, I guess, uh, in a sense, I see where I'm coming from? Or do you see like uh, more of an attack on code? Or do you think that basically the open source nature of all this is essentially like, I don't know, in like like the honey badger right like indestructible are you looking for the easiest way to get your bitcoin off an exchange well i've got it for you it's foundation devices they've got the number one hardware wallet in the passport they've even got a concierge service that can help you get your bitcoin off an exchange within one hour private onboarding session and they've got a great app too which will give you extremely 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 private features on that app so you can use bitcoin in the most secure way possible so i've been working hard trying to get sponsors to help you get your bitcoin off an exchange and i found it with foundation and you can store your seed phrase with a stamp seed punch plate as well so pair all those together use promo code green candle at foundation.xyz and you'll get ten dollars off your entire order all right that's enough for me back to the show i think there will need to be sort of an arbitrary like there, there, there's gonna need to be a whole bunch of like jurisdictional and risk arbitrage like people at the individual level need to make their own decisions about whether they want to be in on or not um i think you know some of the people working at the cutting edge of ecash or, or like tend to be more nims and that makes sense for them um for me I, it's just too late i've been a i've been like you know putting my name on stuff for for a decade plus um but but you know, I, I also kind of invite scrutiny and I invite attacks because I recognize the anti-fragility of like the networks and the things that I'm working on. Like, and, and I've had good experience in the past in my previous startup when when some governments come after us and say, hey, like you can't like do that ride sharing interaction or your vi like, you know, the city of Austin raided my office five years ago. Uh, looking for me to because I was operating in a TNC illegally, the the like rideshare equivalent, and um, they they ended, we ended up trolling the hell out of them, getting a whole bunch of favorable press coverage and 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 interviews and all this stuff, and and like the city ended up looking stupid and backing down, and we got like a whole bunch of users and support out of that, and so I think there there will be, you know, the the, the incentives are such that, you know people i think will be increasingly rewarded for courage in standing up and saying like no look let me explain why you 
fucking feds or whomever it is are wrong. Like you're on the wrong side of history. And you can make that argument in multiple different ways. One, one is um, if you come after builders creating the new financial system, um, if you come after us in the U.S., we'll just leave and we'll go strengthen El Salvador. We'll go like take our talents elsewhere. And and you, you can see how particularly also in an election year, how quickly this stuff becomes politicized. And and fortunately, even though like I think the broader kind of crypto community is is you know, full of shit coiners with bad incentives. It's still a marvel to see the scramble of, you know, politicians and regulators in Washington over the last week, you know, we're recording this end of May, um, because, oh my gosh, like some of the crypto people are starting to cozy up to Trump and Biden doesn't want to lose those voters. Like this is a kind of a voting block and an electorate that's only going to get stronger. And, you know, people are increasingly buying Bitcoin or, or recognizing the value of Bitcoin who are even in the system. Um, so I, I think that we, even though, you know, you always want to be smart and take take calculated risk. Um, I think we are in a position increasingly to start playing offense more than defense. Um, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like you're, you're nailing on the head too, because I think, you know, two years ago, we saw a lot of senators come onto Twitter spaces. I don't know how, how deep in the weeds you were, but a lot of senators would tweet out Bitcoin, see their following get increased and then come onto Twitter spaces and turn out, you know, when they talk about Bitcoin or crypto or whatever, they don't really know what they're talking about. So it's getting more and more politicized. People are understanding that, Hey, like, you know, a lot of people are are almost turning into to single issue voters and like all of this revolution, whether it's AI or, you know, Bitcoin, the financial revolution, it's all kind of coming on to the ballot. And I think like the more that this, uh, you know, this uh, industry, whether it's AI or Bitcoin or whatever, that it's just drastically increasing, right? As Parker Lewis always says, it's gradually then suddenly, I'm sure you're seeing it in the weeds of the AI community, like more and more people are going to start to try to talk about it and try to embrace that. Um, so from like your perspective as, uh, you know, not just like the Bitcoin aspect of it, um, is there like, you know, do you hear politicians kind of, I guess, almost talking about AI on like how to either control it, revolutionize it? Are you like keeping track or keeping tabs of potential, um, yeah. like attack vectors there? Yeah. So, so generally, and we saw this with Rideshare too, generally the most kind of onerous regulation, um, what happens a lot of times is that the state of California will start with a regulation like they, like the California wrote the first statewide TNC bill back in the day that basically encoded Uber's business model into law. And then you've got some like army of lobbyists that takes what's in California and it works it state by state until eventually they can get something passed at the federal level. And then that, that happened with rideshare regulation. Um, and I think the same thing, um, could happen at, you know, it, it, it kind of is happening already at the level of. AI regulation, uh, California just passed, at least I think the House of the Senate, California just passed this like relatively extremely onerous bill saying like, if you create um, an, an AI model above a certain threshold, which they just picked this arbitrary number that was like a little bit above the current ones. Um, and, and if anyone does anything bad with it, like you're liable as the model author. Uh, like imagine like the equivalent is like if if Ford as a company were held liable for like people getting into drunk driving car accidents. It's like completely insane. The the, the legislation has you like have to have like an off button to be able to like turn it off. So it like pre prevents open weights. And now there's a whole bunch of, you know, wealthy, you know, California entrepreneurs, people that are like pushing back against this and kind of like trying to organize counter lobbies. And um, I keep an eye on that because it's all interesting and also i'm always open for like opportunities to like hook into headlines even if the headline even if the response is just like fuck you we're not gonna comply with any of that shit like we're gonna do all of this stuff in open networks it's gonna happen regardless with or without you you can try and like push innovation out of the u.s it's happening anyways um i'm gonna stay in the u.s until i you know like just i'm gonna plant my feet and be like well you know if all of these other states pass this regulation that says you can't do X, Y, and Z. It's like, cool. Well, we, we figured out actually how to run a decentralized compute network and like have this things run. Like we'll build whatever the equivalent is that says, you know, your, your, your efforts to regulate this in that way have completely failed and will continue failing. Now, if you want to have a conversation about like 
how to actually have good outcomes and sort of safety building on top of the openness, we'll have that conversation. But, you know, they're not really equipped to have that conversation because, like they say to every, you know, person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. They don't know a shit about open protocols. Now, some of that is starting to change. Like, and and one thing that I, I hope over the next decade as Bitcoin gets increasingly more sort of like powerful, even with the old systems, is like, how do we make clear that Bitcoin, it's not just about money. It's like a way of doing things. Like it's really, I think, the basis to rebuild a lot of society on a stable foundation. And like, what are those layers above money? And like, what are the sort of governance equivalents from that? My view as a, you know, relatively hardcore Rothbardian-ish libertarian is like, this needs to be done almost entirely by market forces. This can and should be done almost entirely by market forces. Um, and there's just a whole bunch of, you know, primitives that are being built on networks like Noster, whether it's reputation or different contracts, different enforcement mechanisms and, and ratings and data and money all kind of flowing freely. Um, I think that architecture, you know, scaled up a few orders of magnitude could and should provide more of an operating system for societies post the kind of current fiat governments and the question for the u.s or any country is do you want your country to be on that leading edge of that new technology wave and you know social operating systems being upgraded or are you going to fight it and push all those builders elsewhere and then you'll just like your country will lose influence it's an arbitrage game yeah, hundred percent. And and you brought it up too, like the the U.S. Right? I mean, obviously we've seen El Salvador kind of open its arms for anybody that's innovating in the tech sector, and even like you know eliminating taxes and things like that. It's been the narrative, you know, since as long as I can remember that you know U.S. is the land of the entrepreneurs, and that's where people go to find you know the American dream. But it seems like as we're going deeper and deeper in this, right, the fiat bubble is starting to pop, and it's getting harder and harder to start and become an entrepreneur here in the US as somebody who's who's run a couple of startups and things like that. Do you see that, I guess, kind of shifting where it's like, all right, people are starting to, you know, with the the open network, the the rise of like the digital entrepreneur and all that kind of stuff, uh, people starting to, I guess, in a sense, like move away from the US or like realize like they could be country agnostic and, and start a company and, um, you know, kind of move through that way. Are you looking for the number one place to find all the information you can about Bitcoin, whether it's price, whether it's hash rate, whether it's the latest up to date things outside of Bitcoin, whether it's nation state adoption, what have you? Well, I've got the place for you. Check out BitcoinNews.com. They've even got the number one newsletter in the game when it comes to Bitcoin because it it gives you all the up-to-date information on every single thing that happened in the past week that'll come to your inbox every single Monday morning. You could sign up using this code right down here or this link. It's also in the show notes. So come join me and thousands and thousands of other people that are getting the most up-to-date information from BitcoinNews.com and their newsletter. All right, let's get back to the show. I'm seeing some of the smartest people that I know move to or migrate to or you know start supporting energetically and financially uh jurisdictions like madeira in portugal like el salvador like um uh, switzerland like countries that have been explicitly courting and creating regulatory environments uh, uh favorable to your bitcoin bitcoin based innovation um that kind of used to be the us and there's still a lot of people trying to get into the us to build uh, entrepreneurship, but but you know, I think some of those people are, um, I don't know, thinking that the U.S. is what it used to be and not what it is becoming, because uh, a lot of those advantages are being eroded um, uh, for 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 various reasons. But um, I think it's really sad that you've got, you know, someone who I consider to be the greatest statesman of the 21st century, Najib Bukele, leading El Salvador, and you got a whole bunch of people like moving there. And yet the relations with the U.S. and, and, and El Salvador are like not super great. Um, and you've got, you know, them, them feeling incentivized because you've got the U.S. and the sort of, you know, Western or international community, uh, um, you know, financial organizations trying to 
you know, talk them out of like adopting Bitcoin and come back into the, you know, IMF sort of financial system. And we're going to punish you if you don't like, like countries that adopt Bitcoin needs to be rewarded because if you don't, then you push them into tighter relationships with China. China just provided a bunch of funding for their new national library. And this is like a massive failure of the current leadership of, of the U S particularly Biden and the fucking Democrats. Like, Oh no, let's antagonize the people that are doing all of this. Like, bright, obviously clearly superior governance systems for the 21st century. And when you're going to push them into the arms of China, like it's, that needs to be completely reversed. We need to be embracing the Bukele's. We need to be embracing the Millet's. Anytime that we see people moving in this direction, we we have to embrace them or, or we're just going to be fighting over the scraps of the like authoritarian, uh, uh, you know, runoff from, from China and trying to like be lighter weight versions of China. There's a whole bunch of people doing exactly that. And you saw it pretty clearly with the whole COVID lockdown situation where you had a whole bunch of people in the U.S. establishment just importing all of the horrible ideas from China. The lockdowns, the ventilators, a lot of that stuff was built on bad, phony science based on think tanks that China funded and like are just killing our people in mass and then shutting our economy down for years. And it's like, hey, maybe we shouldn't be shutting our economy down because China thinks that's a good idea. For them, we need to be going in the complete opposite direction. And yeah, absolutely. The same people that like shut our economy down are still calling the shots on on a lot of things. Ho hopefully there's enough of a, a reckoning this year in 2024 that that pendulum starts swinging back the other way. Um, but it's it's Bit Bitcoin is is really the relevant factor there. I, I, I think the, people are increasingly calling this sort of the Bitcoin election. Uh, and fortunately, the, the ideals of Bitcoin are, you know, a lot more in line with Bukele and Melee than the sort of decaying late stage empire uh, U.S. Yeah, 100 percent. And I, I, I don't know if I would call this U.S. election the, the Bitcoin election. I do see a lot of like, I mean, it's, it's becoming on the ballot. I just think in the next four years, they're not going to understand Bitcoin enough to really make enough of uh like i guess headwind uh, as far as like policy or anything but i could be wrong i don't know i think that it's going to be like a really interesting time where in the next four years they're going to start to try to develop some policies or start to really i don't know try to try, try to research bitcoin and, and crypto to a lesser extent but i you've think been part a of the, the argument for calling it the bitcoin election is that um you know elections are fought by fighting over the middle because the bases aren't really going to move and with the like Bitcoin slash crypto as an issue, it's something that, you know, like tens of millions of Americans hold Bitcoin or crypto and it cutting across party lines. So like this is a block, if you can call it that, that has the potential of swinging the election to the R's or the D's. And so I think you're going to have people fighting over this electorate and particularly as they're sort of dividing partisan lines, if if it becomes clear that like the Democrats are more anti-crypto and the Republicans are more pro-crypto. I mean, that that that's going to start swinging things. And and I think what you saw over the last week in this this second week of May was kind of like a reflection by the uh, realization by the Democrats, like, oh, shit, we'll get destroyed in 2024 if we're seen as bad on this issue. Um, so I think that that's progress. And I, I expect that to, to evolve and strengthen that dynamic um, between now and November. Yeah, hundred percent, right? And yeah, like you said, we're recording this in May, so it's going to be an interesting next uh, three or four months here, to say the very least. But um, you know, you you've uh, hinted at it a little bit before, but uh, we haven't even gone into your to your background or anything like that. You started off like essentially creating almost like a decentralized Uber, decentralized marketplace via Facebook um, with Arcade City, and you had like the Feds kind of, I guess the Feds, the City of Austin kind of come at you with that. Um, but, you know, what have you learned from your other experiences as an entrepreneur that you think have kind of, uh, I guess, helped equip you here with open agents where you're, you're coming back even stronger. And, uh, you know, despite some some hurdles or anything like that, you're just kind of ready and uh, rolling on your feet. Are you looking for the best way to orange pill your friends and family? Well, I've got a way for you. That's got a little bit of a nostalgia factor. I've got Bitcoin trading cards. They've got the Genesis pack. I've got an open pack right here, sitting here, where you can hand out a bunch of these cards with some great, great artwork. We've got Tyranny. We've got Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt right here, the FUD card. So we've got a lot of great things to teach you a bunch of lessons about Bitcoin in the current space. 
And they've even got some cool things of cool people even doing some stuff in the Bitcoin space. I've got the Bitcoin racing card here, even signed by my boy, Chris Primetime McKenzie. So you can get all of that at btc-tc.com. Use promo code Green Candle. You can get 10% off your entire order to orange pill your friends and family and collect some cool artwork of people that are doing some awesome stuff in the Bitcoin space and help spread that orange pill around the globe. All right, enough from me. Back to the show. Yeah, one, one of the big lessons I learned is just how far incumbents will go to encode their business model into law. So that, that became something that I became very sensitive to. Like it, my this began when I was living in New Hampshire um, and like, Uber was banned in 2015 in my city and I like kept driving anyways. So I kind of like befriended the city uh, leadership of Uber and they kind of had my back in case I got fined or whatever. They're going to support me and stuff. Um, and then like, but like Uber's point person who in the beginning was in my corner, you know, six months later after I was like, okay, I don't think Uber's approach here actually is the right one. I had chafed against certain things that Uber wouldn't let me do. Like they wouldn't let me build up my own recurring customer base. And so like six months later, as, as I was saying earlier about how, you know, these companies start trying to write their business model into law and use the force of government to prevent smaller players, that guy who the, like, the main Uber lobbyist who was like helping me, um, I ended up arguing against him at this like New Hampshire subcommittee meeting where they were like debating the merits of this bill. And they were trying to like put a law into law, New Hampshire law saying, you know, ride shares cannot accept cash. Ride shares must have a certain amount of insurance, like things that Uber did that smaller players did, did not do or could not do. And I was unfortunately just by showing up and arguing like, you know, this 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 guy saying, oh, yeah, like, well, we want to put this into the law because it's a reflection of the industry as it is. And there's no ride share networks. Or there's no ride shares that take cash. And I was like, excuse me, like I've got drivers out there tonight taking cash. So like they struck that part of the bill out. But like I have not been able to match the like you know, Uber built the lobbyist, the largest lobbying army in the country, uh, in the world, actually. So, you know, we made one piece of success in New Hampshire, but they overall were able to get their business model basically written into law uh, everywhere else. We're seeing that right now where you've got companies like Sam Altman, uh, OpenAI, Sam Altman, Anthropic, Daria Amade, uh, Inflection, now Microsoft guy, Mustafa. These guys were like the heads of the like closed source AI labs flying to D.C., having meetings with regulators, basically trying to scare the shit out of them, pushing this whole narrative that like AGI is going to kill us all unless we regulate it. And of course they want to be the partners that regulate it. And then, you know, set that, set their, their, their model into law and then screw everybody else. Um, and I, 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 I hate that. And fortunately there's enough kind of like pushback and people recognize that that's like a strategy that is bad and like open and openness here actually is, uh, important for a whole lot of reasons, including you can argue for um, national security and the, these people engaged in regulatory capture is is like a bad thing. Um, and I'm I'm sort of doubling down on the approach that I eventually found successful with Arcade, which is like I quickly in the early days realized that like I'm not going to be able to beat Uber on the regulatory battle, but. I can make them irrelevant by connecting people peer to peer in a way that is outside the sort of like regulatory and uh, uh, purview, or at least their willingness to come after uh, uh, that. And so we had, you know, occasions in in Austin where our network, you know, eventually the sometimes the city would get bored of I don't know what else they were doing, but like in once in 2016, once in 2019, they like sent like a, they set up stings and they like had they lured one of our drivers into a sting and they like would arrest them and uh, or not arrest them, they would impound their vehicle and find them and every time the two times that that happened you know we provided immediate support to the driver you know got their car back for them put out a press release and like like got the entire city of austin including a bunch of like sympathetic media dumping on like you cops have nothing better to do than to crack down on this like server service that's providing like needed service to people trying to get home safely at night and in every time that that happened the network grew we got a bunch of goodwill the like couple hundred dollars of fines that we had to pay was like, shit, we'll do this all day. And so like we had very real, like material benefits from digging in our heels and saying, no, you are all wrong. We're in the right. We're going to keep doing what are doing. You can come at us if you want to, but like, is that really the best use of taxpayer dollars? Um, 
I'm I'm super excited to make that same kind of uh, stance in in the AI scene. And 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 who knows? I don't. It may not even get to the point where like government people are coming at us or the open source community uh, for creating these these larger models. In part because like there's just there's a lot a lot a lot of energy around open uh, around AI and and people don't want to be you know um, pushing that overseas. But if push came to shove, like. Can we do what we need to do organizing people around the world? I mean, the, the the first, before we sort of pivoted to agents, we created this decentralized compute marketplace where anyone around the world could contribute a retail computer of theirs and we could like plug them into a network where they were able to like serve requests in this completely decentralized fashion and pay them lightning sats. And like, we could do that for compute. We could do that for models. There isn't quite like the demand yet because right now we don't want to be competing against these like VC subsidized infrastructure companies but like if we ever need to kind of eject from from regulated environment land into like purely unregulated decentralized land it's always an option for us now with all that it almost kind of reminds me of like you know the pictures that we saw like sam bankman freed uh you know lobbying there for like ftx and lobbying for crypto right and in, in the in the eight it in um i don't know in congress and everything like that where it seems like you know the the closed source i guess more uh you know people who want to control the ai system that's what they're doing right they're throwing their money behind it they're kind of going through it that way now um you know you said you're not necessarily super worried about it because it seems like there's going to be a kickback but um i guess do you see that as kind of uh Maybe not to the extent of like the crypto, like, you know, where people are going to be losing billions of dollars, but in a sense where it's like, all right, all these people are going to try to control this one aspect, this one growing industry. So they're just going to throw a bunch of lobbying dollars behind it in hopes that they can essentially monopolize it and keep it control from themselves. And then, you know, in turn, people would probably, you know, I guess in in turn revolt and try to find some some way to to open source it or find some sort of open source technology. But in the short term, you know, a lot of people would probably get either manipulated or fooled by this uh, closed source AI. Does that make sense? I think in it, the, the cost of regulating AI will be measured in scientific breakthroughs that don't happen and lives lost from the ability to say, cure cancer, or, or there's a lot of innovation going into applying AI to advancing scientific research as one example. And <laughs> I don't know, what was this tweet I saw recently is like, blah, blah, AGI, foom, foom, foom. Like, how about you shut the, I mean, cure cancer first. Like, um, you know, AI is going to potentially enable all sorts of scientific breakthroughs. Um, do governments want to slow that down? And, 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 like, do governments want to um, forfeit the productivity gains from having easy access to this new technology? It's like, like you want to go back to 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 the year two thousand and say, like, no, you can't build that website. You need to go to you know get a permission slip from the central uh, you know website authority. It's like completely ludicrous. And um, fortunately, we in Bitcoin have you know a pretty strong. Uh, you know, background of cypherpunks, and we sort of have a lot of those people in our orbit, uh, anyways. So if it comes push comes to shove, it's just like we we have the technology to route around any controls, I think. And um, you know, who in the world wants our presence, our dollars, our you know money in some ways? Um, and we'll just go there. Yeah, hundred percent. All right. So before I let you go, I want to, I want you to dive into open agents. Tell tell us all about what you're building and uh, like what you guys are revolutionizing in the AI space. Because you know I, I've gotten some of it from from our interactions here and at Pleb Lab and everything like that. But you know, t tell the world here what what uh, all is uh, to come from open agents. Yeah, so Open Agents is building your one-stop shop for AI agents that's building them, that's selling them, that's using them. Um, we want to kind of want to let people make sense of agents uh, and know that they can go to one place and have like a one-stop shop where, hey, I can pay some Bitcoin or connect a credit card and like get that agent to do my homework, get that agent to teach me something, get that agent to... Oh, let me click to access, you know, give it permission, limited permission to my, um, you know, 
spending wallet or my, you know, third party service that I want it to do certain things um, and, and, and be able to reliably have AI work for you. Our definition of agent is AI that works for you. Um, and so whatever you are trying to do in your life that you want help with, um, we want you to be able to have an agent that does that. Now, part of how what makes this work is it's a marketplace and we're not going to have every need figured out right away. But if we have a way for people to come forward and say like, oh, well, that agent that I see people are doing kind of works, but it's not quite what I need. I want you to be able to like type in a comment. I wish it had this or express your interest that now some builder can say, oh, I'm going to build that because this person you know, is some teacher or runs a school system or whatever. And if they have an agent that can do X, then that can get me paid in, you know, Y dollars on the back end. So that our, our kind of answer for how agents don't suck and how they become reliable is by creating a marketplace that allows this sort of market forces to um, help build up a market. So openagents.com right now, you can go there and have access to, for example, chat with the top 18 chat models. You can build a very basic agent. If people use your agents, then they can get paid. And I think by the time this interview airs, we'll have uh, the ability for developers to add their plugins to agents so the agents are upgradable. And then if people use your agent with a plugin or they use anyone's agent with a plugin that you wrote, you're going to get a percentage of the sats from that, the revenue share. Uh, we just think that that's necessary to incentivize people to kind of create uh, building blocks of agents that can be reused and uh, adapted and built into different agents. Wow, that's sick. So it's almost like, I, I guess, almost like a creator network kind of for, you know, developers and everything like that who wants to create some sort of AI. They don't need to do the, I guess, the bare bones of it, but they can help build the skeleton out. That's pretty sick. So, um, yeah, how's everything going in like what state? I don't know if you got to divulge, but like what stage you guys are at in like, um, you know, uh, where, what's next outside of uh, this development stuff? I, I don't know if you can line out the roadmap or whatever for the rest of the year. Yeah, we did. Um, we were part of the first cohort of the Wolf Bitcoin and Lightning Accelerator in New York a year ago. That's been massively helpful. Um, we entered Wolf doing something completely different, but it pivoted and just kind of been able to pivot with conviction and meet people who like were aligned with our vision. We're able to give us a little bit of seed funding. Uh, so, you know, we have a company where we, we've got a pretty ambitious roadmap for the next few months. Um, just building out this fully multi-sided marketplace where people can reliably build agents. Um, yeah. Get paid to build agents or use agents for, for different stuff. The, the, the goal, as you say, like creator network. Yeah. We're going to be increasingly adding more kind of like social features also, because we want people to be able to uh, build agents, be discovered, build an audience and have the kind of like, community interaction and discussion around agents to find out what's the best ones uh, and then just separately make it super easy for someone to be like, oh, I want that one for this or that one for this. 100%. Well, all right, Chris. Well, thank you so much. You've been very generous with your time. You told us openagents.com, but where can they find you? And uh, I guess like maybe on social or anything like that, feel free to- Openagents.com. And I'm super active on Twitter. Uh, the Open Agents Inc. Uh, Twitter feed, X feed is um, super hilarious. And I- post a lot of bangers there. So uh, I'm also at Atlantis Pleb on X and I think Noster also. Yeah. All right. Awesome. And I'll put all that in show notes and Chris, thanks so much, man. Brandon, thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this great episode. If you enjoyed this one and you want some more content, click on the link right here and check out my latest interview with Tom Luongo. We get into it all. If you've known Tom, He's a wild one, so stay tuned. And if you found some value in this podcast, please smash that like button. Hit that subscribe button so you get notified of the next videos. All right, I'll catch you at the next one.